Did you notice something as we read from the Old Testament this morning? I don't know about you, but it was clear. It was something unmistakable. Something changed. Something just clicked as we read. And yeah, I, I will admit that maybe it was just me. Maybe the click just happened in my own head, but it was so loud that I thought that everyone could hear it. Now, could be because I am a, a bit of a, an historian. Uh, I actually do have a bachelor's in history. And maybe that gives me an awareness of things that others might not notice. But here's what I noticed as I read this morning. I noticed we had entered into a new era. An era of documented history. This, this is what it says in our reading. So all the elders of Israel came to the king at Hebron, and King David made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. You see, there is something different about that statement, different from any other statement that goes before it in the Bible. And that's simply because David is the first person in the Bible for whom we have independent confirmation of his existence. He's the first individual of the Bible for whom there is extra biblical evidence. Oh, I know, there have been archaeological discoveries that confirm a few details from the Bible that are older than David, you know, the existence of certain cities or population groups, but there is nothing, nothing before David that we could use as evidence for the fact that a certain person existed. But for David, we have that. Now, we don't exactly have proof of the existence of David himself, but what we do have are ancient inscriptions that have been uncovered that do refer to something called the House of David. So we know, we know for sure that there was a dynasty of ancient kings who traced the foundation of their rule to a man named David. That's about all we can prove about the man. And I know that might not seem like very much, but actually it's really very significant for that time and place. And what's more, there's a bit more that we can say. In our reading this morning, it goes on to describe how David occupied the stronghold and named it the city of David. And David built the city all around from the millow inwards. And as we read on, it becomes clear that this is a reference to David establishing his capital in a little place called Jerusalem. You might have heard of it. And in fact, archaeologists have found evidence of ancient construction near the top of Mount Zion in Jerusalem that does correspond to what is described in this passage and to that period of time. And in particular, they have discovered a retaining wall that they have identified as the millow that is mentioned in that passage. It was apparently considered to be quite an engineering feat at the time, as it's something that is mentioned several times in the Bible. And if you put all of that together, we even have a date. See, if David existed and if he is responsible for the construction of what is called the city of David, then we can say that he must have ruled in Jerusalem around about the year 1000 BC. And if you ever want to impress people at a party with your biblical knowledge, you should pull that one out. It's easy to remember 1000 BC and it's actually the first confirmed date in the Bible. Now, I know that some of you, maybe especially those of you who don't particularly get excited by, 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 about history, might just be saying, so what? 
So what that, that this is something that has been confirmed by extra biblical sources? What does that matter? Just because something isn't mentioned outside the Bible doesn't mean that it didn't happen. And right, that is absolutely true. But it still means something. It means that when we get to the story of David in the Bible, we finally have something concrete that we can hold up and compare to the biblical account. And the Bible does say many things, of course, about the rule of King David. And and we're not going to expect to find historical evidence for every detail, but we should be able to find some corroboration. The Bible says, for example, that David established a large kingdom, a kingdom that united all of the tribes of Israel over a large territory. And this was the first time there had been such a united kingdom, and this united kingdom endured throughout his life and throughout the life of his son Solomon before it all kind of fell apart, never to be reunited again. Now this, this would have been an enormous achievement for that time and place. And what's more, it it would be the kind of administration that you would expect to leave some traces in the archaeological record. If there was such a united kingdom in David's time, we ought to be able to find traces of it in the ground. And so archaeologists have searched for those traces. And news alert, they haven't found those traces. On the contrary, archaeologists have found very little in the way of evidence for any sort of political unity in that area at that time. And as a result, most scholars and archaeologists today say that the evidence seems to indicate that if David was real, and that if he ruled in Jerusalem, his kingdom must have been actually pretty small. It was probably not much more than a chieftainship, and it didn't extend all that far from Mount Zion. But, it seems, as time went by, kings from the line of David looked back at their founder, looked back at the time of David and Solomon as a kind of a a golden age, And they naturally exaggerated the size and the importance of that kingdom. So there's actually very little evidence for a large united kingdom under David. But I'll tell you what there is a lot of evidence for. There's a lot of evidence for the idea of such a united kingdom. For much of the history in the Bible after 1000 BC, there were two kingdoms, two kingdoms in the land of Israel. The kingdom of Israel in the north and the kingdom of Judah in the south. And for much of that time, the northern kingdom was the larger, the stronger, more prosperous of the two. The kingdom of Judah in the south was not much more than a runt of a kingdom. But the southern kingdom had its capital at Jerusalem and it had the house of David in charge. And it seems clear that the idea, the idea that there had been a united kingdom under the rule of David and Solomon was established and it grew in the southern kingdom of Judah. And based on this idea, The rulers of the house of David would claim that they really also should be able to rule the people in the north. And this claim became more and more insistent as time went by and became particularly powerful when the northern kingdom was destroyed by the Assyrian Empire and in a seeming miracle, the southern kingdom managed to survive. And at that time, prophets like the great prophet Isaiah proclaimed that, yes, the time had finally come to reestablish a united kingdom. But it never happened. Over time, this idea of a united kingdom 
became linked to the idea that the temple in Jerusalem was the only place where people could correctly worship Yahweh, the God of Israel. And even this idea of a united kingdom continued as an idea once the ruling house of David had ceased to exist following the Babylonian exiles. The exiles returned from Babylon, many of them with the idea that God had sent them back to rebuild the old kingdom of David, even if it didn't quite work out that way. Centuries later, the Hasmonean kings of Judea, who did not claim to be descended from King David, still wanted to re-establish his kingdom, or at least the idea of his kingdom, and they entered into a war of conquest to bring Galilee under Judean control. And honestly, to this very day, the idea of, ki of David's kingdom is a driving force behind the modern Israeli state, and especially behind the establishment of Israeli settlements in occupied territory, something that has obviously often rendered the hope for peace in that part of the world rather complicated. So it's kind of amazing when you think about it that the idea of the, of the kingdom of David and Solomon has actually had more influence on the future course of history than the actual reality of those kingdoms on the ground. The idea is more powerful than the reality. And yet as I think about it, maybe that's not so strange. As I think about it, maybe that's how it always works. And maybe it's not necessarily a bad thing. We gather today on Canada Day. We also gather on the American celebration of Independence Day. And there's been a lot of discussions this year about how or even if we ought to celebrate Canada Day, especially given that over the last couple of months we have been confronted in a very graphic way with the failings and the shortcomings of our country as regards our relationship with its indigenous people and the residential school system. And there really doesn't seem to be very much to celebrate about that. As for our American neighbors, Oh, I'm quite sure that they would never tone down their patriotic celebrations. But at the same time, there's no doubt that this past year has clearly tarnished the image of that country in the hearts of many of its citizens. When you think of the events that prompted the Black Lives Matter movement, the, the horrible pandemic experience, and an insurrection at the nation's capital. As I think of these celebrations and how the idea of David's kingdom became bigger than the actual kingdom itself, I need to ask the question, what is it? What is it that we celebrate when we celebrate a nation? I know there are some who really struggle with the idea of looking at our past with a critical eye. This is because we have long associated the idea of our country with a glorified view of its past. We have looked to the stories of heroic settlers heading out into the clearings, of visionary leaders like John A. Macdonald and Edgerton Ryerson, of brave leaders like Generals Wolfe and Brock to tell us who we were and what we stood for. And if that is who we are, well, that makes the act of looking critically at those heroes feel a little bit dangerous. In fact, the act of looking back can feel dangerous in itself because very few policies of the past are going to stand up against our present day sensibilities. And so all of a sudden, indigenous people 
asking to have their experiences heard and validated, validated, or even just historians doing their jobs, feels like an attack, an attack against our patriotic spirit. But I do not believe that we should be afraid of our history. And I certainly do not believe that we should be afraid of facing up to the truth and the reality of our history. In many ways, our idea of a country is based on an idealized picture picture of the past, uh, an idealized picture just as romanticized as was the United Kingdom under David. But just because that past is not quite the ideal that we may have thought it was, just because it, it turns out that we may have blinded ourselves to some of the flaws in our past, does not mean that the idea itself does not have a purpose. I'll tell you something. I have an idea of Canada. I have an idea of a Canada that takes care of its people, of all of its people. I have an idea of a Canada where we do not value people less because of their race or their origins. I have an idea of a country where we value and care for the land and honor those who have lived in relationship with with it for thousands of generations. That is my idea. That is my picture of Canada. I suspect that it is God's idea as well. Now, did that ideal Canada exist in the past? No, it did not. Certainly not in its entirety, and there have been many, many cases where it fell far short of that idea. Well then, does that ideal Canada exist in the present? I'm afraid I've got to say the answer there is also no. But that does not mean that it's not the real Canada. The idea is real. And if we can commit ourselves, and if we can work at it, that idea can begin to align more closely with the reality on the ground, in the future. Because you know where my idea of Canada will be found? In the future. And ever in my heart. Where? Where will yours be found? Lord our God, thank you for confronting us with the truth about the history, the past, and indeed the present of our nation. Thank you also for putting before us the idea of what our nation should be and can be. And let us, with your help, Commit ourselves to working towards that. Amen.